Good evening. Welcome to uh, tonight's program presented by the Riley Institute here at Furman. We are pleased to welcome guests from the university as well as many of our friends from the Furman community, uh, from the Greenville community. Uh, we'd like to offer a special thank you to uh, President Davis and Secretary Riley for being here. Uh, my name is Matt Rosenberg and I'm a sophomore here at Furman. Uh, I won't be formally introducing our speaker tonight even though it's someone I've known my entire life. Instead, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the format. Our speaker tonight will touch on two very different topics, one from his time as Chief of Staff at the FBI and one from his current job running the DEA. He will talk for about 15 minutes, and then there will be plenty of time for questions afterwards. So please have some questions ready. Uh, thank you to the Riley Institute and the Political Science Department for putting this all together. Uh, they did this on short notice, and as usual, they did a great job. I'm honored to introduce Professor Elizabeth Smith, who is the Chair of the Political Science Department at Furman. Professor Smith will introduce our speaker tonight, who also happens to be my father. <laughs> Professor Smith. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, President Davis, and Secretary Riley, and Dean Beckford um, for joining us this evening. It's an honor to introduce our speaker tonight. As we all know, our nation faces numerous challenges from environmental degradation to illegal immigration to increasing income inequality. Our guest tonight, sharing the expertise he has gained from his vast experience in government in such significant roles as the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District for Virginia and Southern District of Texas, and the Chief of Staff and Senior Counselor to the Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, to senior posts in the Department of Justice as a Counterterrorism and National Security Specialist, to his current position as the Head of the Drug Enforcement Administration. We'll discuss two of the most pressing challenges facing us in the 21st century, the threat we face from terrorism, as well as the threat we face from heroin and drug addiction. The events of 9-11 woke most Americans up to the threat we face from terrorism. Many of us heard for the first time then about a group called Al-Qaeda and that the destruction of the World Trade Center, the attack on the Pentagon, and the crash of an airplane in Pennsylvania were the result of the actions of this network of terrorists. But while this group was new to many Americans, it had in fact been organizing and attacking us long before. This same network was also responsible for the U.S. Embassy bombings in Africa in 1998, the attack on the USS Cole in 2000, and the bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993. While Osama bin Laden's death on May 2, 2011 was seen as the beginning of the dismantling of the main Al-Qaeda leadership, Al-Qaeda affiliates in places like Yemen and Syria continue to terrorize to this day. And now, with a power vacuum created in Iraq and Syria, and partly as a result of a power struggle ensuing within Al-Qaeda, we're faced with a newly energized ter terrorist network in the form of the Islamic State, or ISIS, or ISIL, a terrorist organization which is recre rec increasingly recruiting, especially youth, from Western nations, including our own. While the threat of terrorism hangs over our nation, we are also challenged within by the dangers posed by illegal drugs, in part because of the increased use of opioids for pain relief, the subsequent crackdown on the abuse of these prescription drugs, and the relatively low price for heroin. According to the DEA's recent report and the CDC's National Center for Health Statistics, the number of deaths in the United States from heroin overdose has increased 172% between 2010 and 2013. And many of these deaths are among first-time users. And like the recruiting targets for ISIS, it's often young people like you Furman students who are the victims. In light of these significant issues, it is especially important that we hear from experts about the causes, consequences, and potential solutions to these problems. So with no further ado, I invite the head of the Drug Enforcement Administration, longtime civil servant, and current Furman parent, Mr. Chuck Rosenberg, to the podium to share with us his insight.
Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, really, truly an honor to be here. Uh, just if I may start with a personal note. Uh, there are two men in my life that I consider to be my hero. Uh, one, my dad, who passed away a few years ago, and you met the other one tonight. So it's a great honor for me to be introduced in part by my son. It's actually pretty cool. Um, thank you, too, for a wonderful turnout. Uh, I think these are important topics, but of course I'm a little bit biased, so you'll determine that. Uh, I am uh, new to the Drug Enforcement Administration. I've spent most of my professional life in federal law enforcement, so I have a lot to learn. But some of the things that I've learned have really, really disturbed me. And I want to share a little bit of that with you. Not to disturb you too, but I want you to have a complete understanding of what it is we're up against right now. Um, I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint. I'd rather just talk. But when there's a single slide that I think would be helpful, uh, I'll show it to you. Here's one of them. That green line shows the number of people who die each year in the United States from a drug overdose. It's about 46,000. I'm a huge baseball fan. I know, I think I'm in Braves territory, aren't I? No, I'm a Nats fan. Um, but if you're a Braves fan or a Nats fan or a fan of any other team, imagine sitting in a stadium full of fans, because most baseball stadiums hold about 45 or 46,000 people. And imagine every single one of them being dead within a year. What's even more stunning, the blue line, which is trending down, and that's a good thing, the number of people who die in motor vehicle accidents, and the red line, which is relatively flat, but disturbing nonetheless, the number of people who die from firearms. And what you can see very simply is we're losing about 50% more people a year to drug overdoses than we are to firearms or to motor vehicle accidents. That's an absolutely stunning number. I've spent a uh, career as a federal prosecutor, so I'm not given to hyperbole, uh, but it's fair to call this an epidemic. It is fair to call this an epidemic. And what the DEA does about it, uh, despite how we are sometimes bumper stickered in the press, I mean, we are not busting kids at Furman for smoking pot in their dorm rooms, which, by the way, I don't recommend doing. <laughs> we are tangling with the most dangerous uh, international drug cartels and the most violent criminal gangs in the United States, in large part because of this. Let me just tell you something else about this. Where does this come from? We are about 5% of the world's population. Okay? America has about 5% of the world's population. We consume about 99% of the world's hydrocodone. That's a stunning number. Hydrocodone is a highly addictive opioid. It's given for pain relief, and it's prescribed legally in the United States. Again, 5% of the world's population, 99% of the world's hydrocodone. And what we know, because we study it, is that the transition uh, to heroin, usually, 80% of the time, starts with those who get addicted to pain medication, right? So, you're a, you're a college football player. You tear your ACL. The doctor, uh, you know, he, 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 they operate on you. They give you hydrocodone. You get addicted. You run out of hydrocodone, highly addictive, and you're not careful. You end up buying heroin on the streets. I know that sounds like a ludicrous chain of events, right? That's something that would never, ever happen to somebody in this room, except that it happens all the time. We're losing 46,000 people a year. Now, those are all drugs, okay? I don't want to be misleading, um, but that's the chain. And remember, four out of five uh, heroin users start on pain pills. A big problem. I wanted you to see that. It's fairly disturbing. Even though I had spent a career in federal law enforcement, I didn't know that. I know it now. And it's something that keeps me awake at night. Uh, so I have absolutely no segue. I have absolutely no transition to the other thing I wanted to present to you. <laughs> I've been trying to think of a transition, but there is none, other than to say that the job that I had immediately before this one 
was his chief of staff to the director of the FBI. He's Jim Comey, and he's a dear friend of mine. Uh, we were federal prosecutors together. And when President Obama picked him to uh, run the FBI, he called me up and he said, hey, look, dude, this is a quote. He said, look, dude, if I'm going, you're coming with me. Uh, and how do you say no to the director of the FBI? You, 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 you don't. <laughs> so I wanted to tell you a little bit about my life there and what I worked on. Um, Professor Smith touched on it eloquently, but I'm going to expand on it a little bit. And I'm going to show you another slide or two. But when I was a baby prosecutor, the overseas terrorism threat was Al-Qaeda. Most Americans had not heard of Al-Qaeda until the events of 9-11. And frankly, later in my career, uh, I had the privilege of serving as the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, I'm completely biased, but it is the finest U.S. Attorney's Office in the nation. Uh, and we had the privilege of handling a number of high-profile uh, espionage and terrorism prosecutions, uh, like Robert Hansen and Aldrich Ames, uh, the FBI spy and the CIA spy. And I was in charge of the 9-11 prosecution, so I was somewhat familiar with Al-Qaeda. Uh, many of you may not know that Al-Qaeda took its first shot at the World Trade Center in 1993, when they uh, parked a truck bomb in the sub-basement which exploded and killed six people, but the towers stood. Al-Qaeda's MO has always been the big, spectacular attack. And I'm going to describe that in some detail, not much, only to contrast it with ISIS, the threat that you all have heard about but may not actually know very well. well let me give you some background. So Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda's goal one day still remains, although unstated um, in terms of time and place, to create a caliphate, a place where all of its adherents uh, gather to live under uh, a particular form of, uh, of Islam. By the way, I will say at the outset, because I mean it and because you need to hear it, Islam is a religion of great peace. Um, there, I don't believe there's actually any dispute about that, nor should there be. Like many religions, it has some followers who have completely corrupted it. And those are the folks who follow Al-Qaeda and ISIS and others like them. But it is a religion of great peace. But Al-Qaeda's stated goal is to form a caliphate so its followers can join. Al-Qaeda always goes for the big spectacular attack. The 93 attack on the World Trade Center failed, right? But as uh, Professor uh, Smith mentioned, there was the uh, bombings of the uh, embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998, the attack on the USS Cole in 2000, uh, the successful attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon in 2001, the Madrid train bombing in 2005, and on and on and on. And the way Al Qaeda works, because big spectacular attacks take lots and lots of planning, is to draw people in. Uh, you, you all know, I believe, that Al-Qaeda got its start uh, in the late 1980s, uh, following the war with Afghanistan. To draw people in, I'm sorry, the war in Afghanistan with the Soviets, uh, to draw people in, to train them, to vet them, to train them, to vet them, and to train them some more, and then to deploy them as part of these attacks. ISIS is completely different, completely different, a very different model, a much more modern, much more pernicious, much more dangerous, much more vile model in the following sense. ISIS, ISIS followers subscribe to the same sort of corruption uh, of uh, Islam, but ISIS has already declared a caliphate. It looks something like this. Again, I'm not a big fan of slides, but every now and then one helps. On the left is a historical map of the caliphate from 622 to 750. On the right, at the bottom, is the caliphate that ISIS or ISIL, it's sort of interchangeable, I won't bore you with why, um, declared in June and then again in September of 2014. That's what they aim to take. Right? Those are its historic lands. 
They match up somewhat with the caliphate that existed in the 600s. That's what they're after. And here's how they intend to do it. Unlike Al-Qaeda, which stages a big, spectacular mass attack, mass casualties, with operatives that they train and vet, ISIS does something very different. We know that there are some number of lost souls in the United States, right? Some number of people who are just a couple of beats off. And we also know that ISIS has some number of followers on Twitter, oh, roughly a thousand, don't know a precise number. Some number of those thousand are us, FBI agents, academics, journalists, who are following them on Twitter to see what they're saying and doing. But some number are those lost souls. And what, uh, what ISIS says to them is come to the caliphate, come be a part of that. We need you, we want you. But we understand that not all of you can come. We get that. And we're not interested in the big spectacular attack. Kill in our name. Kill a soldier, kill an agent, kill a police officer, kill somebody in uniform, kill wherever you are because that furthers our goal. And folks, everyone in this room probably has a phone on them right now, right? And most of you probably have a Twitter app downloaded to it. You get constant messages from ISIS over and over and over, day after day after day. Kill, kill, kill. And then, when folks are ready to take them up on the offer, um, the ISIS handlers, if you will, um, ask them to jump off of Twitter and go to some other platform, a platform where we are dark. By that, I mean platforms that are fully encrypted with end-to-end uh, -end -end encryption for their data, which we literally cannot see, even with a court order. Some of you may have heard of the going dark problem. That's it. The fact that legitimate companies, and by the way, I, I don't in any way demonize them. They're under significant financial and legal pressures to deliver to their customers just what the customers want, which is complete and total privacy. And so they encrypt their communications end to end, right? And we can't see it, even with a court order. And that is what is so frightening. Because when ISIS has finally broken somebody, somebody who can't join the caliphate but wants to act out in its name, this is what they tell them to do. Kill where you are. We've seen that in the United States, we've seen it in Canada, we've seen it in other parts of the world. Folks who believe they are furthering the mission of ISIS, they're furthering the caliphate by doing exactly what these vile handlers have asked them to do. In a nutshell, that is the difference between Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Huge problem uh, for us as citizens, not just of the United States, but of the world. Uh, you've seen attacks in Europe, you will see more. You've seen attacks in the United States, you will see more. Um, it is a very frightening proposition, particularly since we've now, uh, we now know that once they leave certain media platforms, they are gone until they resurface, often at a place and time of their own choosing. So big challenges. Uh, I've been very privileged uh, to be both at the DEA now, recently, uh, working on you know, dry, uh, violent drug cartels with an astonishing uh, uh, cadre of men and women who are doing violent and difficult and dangerous work in the United States and around the world. And I was very, very fortunate to be at the FBI on two separate occasions to work on this. Um, so let me tell you what I'm going to do. I recently read uh, a book entitled Lincoln at Gettysburg. Uh, I don't recommend it, wasn't particularly good. <laughs> but I've always been astonished by the speech that Lincoln gave there. Probably the greatest speech in American political history. Um, it lasted uh, two and a half minutes, and it was 272 words. And so whenever I speak for more than two and a half minutes, or use more than 272 words, I begin to break out in a bit of a rash. So I'm going to stop. Um, what I really want to do is take your questions. I think your questions are probably a lot more interesting uh, than the stuff I prepared to talk about. If there are no questions, I warn you, I will just continue talking. As Matthew will tell you, that is not a very pleasant experience. 
So Professor Smith is going to help moderate this. Uh, and I, uh, there is no, and by the way, there is nothing out of bounds. Uh, if I can't answer something, I will tell you that. Um, if I don't really know the answer, I'll make one up. <laughs> uh, but there's nothing out of bounds, so fire away. So the advanced team will cruise around. So ha just raise your hand if you have a question. And since I'm standing right here, Jonathan, I'm going to give you my microphone. Thank you. I have a two-part question. Is, uh, is it easy? We'll see. All right. <laughs> First, um, how is the DEA re reconciling the conflict, conflict between the decriminalization of marijuana in certain states and the criminalization of mar marijuana in most states in this country? Could, can I? The, the, the odds that I'll remember the first part of the question ask you, after you answer the, ask the second part are unbelievably small. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> At my age, they're close to zero. So let me do this. Let me, ask, let me answer the first part and then sure. ask the second one. Got it. Is that fair? That sounds great. So how do we reconcile the fact that in some states uh, marijuana has been decriminalized? Um, it's hard to reconcile, quite frankly. It remains illegal under federal law, right? So we can prosecute it as federal law enforcement officers anywhere in the United States. But the climate is changing, and I recognize that. I've told my special agents in charge, the men and women who run the various divisions of the DEA, to, uh, to investigate and prosecute the most important cases in their jurisdiction. And by and large, those tend not to be marijuana. They tend to be heroin, right, fentanyl, synthetics, cocaine, meth, really, really dangerous stuff. In some places, it is marijuana. And don't forget this, it's important. Two things, marijuana is not good for you, it's just not. And it's also tied to remarkable violence in Mexico and in the streets of the United States. So I don't really have trouble um, when my men and women bring those cases. I support that. But since I've told them to prioritize the most important work first, it tends not to be marijuana, in part because some of the other problems are so incredibly pressing. Is that a fair? That's great. Um, Thank you. Then let's stop. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. What's the, what's the second part? So the second part of my question concerns a substanti substantial portion of the funding that the DA received. So last year, the DA received over $20 million from civil asset forfeiture funds mm -hmm. um, in which law enforcement can seize an individual's property or money um, without convicting or even charging this uh, said individual. Can you address the concerns that civil asset forfeiture funds represent a lack of due process and the concern that it may create um, police for profit? Yeah, it's a very sophisticated question. It's a really excellent question. I, I reject part of the premise, though, uh, and I'll tell you which part I reject. Uh, you're right that it's uh, tied to a civil case and not a criminal case. And even people who don't like forfeiture laws, in other words, the car you use, the plane you use, the boat you use, tied to your drug trafficking becomes ours. Most people will grant us the, the, you know, the, the, the right, the, the, the interest in that property in a criminal case. Civil asset forfeiture is different, but it's not without due process. And that's the important point. Right? In order to seize your stuff, we still go to a federal judge, and she still signs an order, and we still have to make our proof. So it's not like we're just taking it because we don't like you. All right? I mean, that wouldn't be a bad reason, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's not how it works. So I think, though, uh, and, and this is sort of the, the genius of your question, uh, and it really is a very sophisticated question, we have to be very smart and careful about how we do it, because there is a criticism uh, not that I entirely embrace, but there is, there is a criticism that there is a policing for profit mentality. I think at the federal level, which is what I can speak to, we're extremely careful. But in order to maintain the trust 
of the citizens we're sworn to protect, we better continue to be careful. So it is with process. It's just not tied to a criminal case. But it's an excellent question. No more out of you. <laughs> I've made, I always make this mistake of talking to smart audiences. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find dumb audiences. <laughs> um. <laughs> Someone just said Wofford? <laughs> <laughs> That, that, that is, that's, we're not going to do that here. <laughs> yeah, there, there are brothers Go Dins. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you so much for um, giving up a part of your time to be here to oh, speak with us. Thank you for giving up part of your time to listen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you a question uh, specifically about your experience with the um, FBI. Um, I'm interested in separating narratives of terrorist groups mm -hmm. and the people who may or may not be unknowingly affected um, simply because they are of the same faith or belief as those counter-terrorist organizations. Um, I have a personal motive for asking this, um, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but um, what do you think is the single most um, important advice um, for all of us um, who see words like ISIS or Al-Qaeda or Sharia law and perhaps identifying those words with believers of the same faith, but may not be believers of their um, claim to the faith? Uh, no, it's a very good question. And, and I hope I did it some justice in my remarks, because I do believe uh, that Islam is a religion of great peace. It is, right? The overwhelming majority of its adherents are good and peaceful people. You'd want them living next door to you. So part of this is a cultural thing, right? It's the way we react to certain images, to certain words, to certain sounds. And um, you know, driving that out of our culture is a very, very hard thing to do. One thing I want to tell you, because I think it's important, if you actually looked at the domestic uh, uh, guidelines by which the FBI operates, you may not believe me, but I'm going to ask you to. Highly respect of First Amendment rights, closely tethered to the Constitution. We work through courts, right? Unlike what you might see on television, I know this is going to come as a shock. Not everything on TV is true, <laughs> nor is everything on the Internet, another shocking development. Um, the FBI that I know and love, the DEA that I know and love, is very, very closely tethered to the Constitution. Um, some of that requires a leap of faith, right? Not everyone is willing to make that leap of faith. I've seen it up close. I'm also a citizen, um, in addition to having worked in law enforcement. I'm a citizen. Uh, what I see are men and women trying really, really, really hard to get this right and to work under enormous pressure. And you often read about us when we get it wrong. I can tell you that you really don't read about us when we get it right, which is the overwhelming majority of the time. I, I hope you'll believe me that you ought to be comfortable with the way we operate in the United States. We're not perfect, we're fallible because we're human, right? Um, but it's pretty darn impressive. So. I don't think I get to call on anyone, right? That's not how it works. <laughs> Could I tell you who I am not calling on again? <laughs> <laughs> um, recent studies have shown that only around 30% of ISIL's members are ideologues and the rest were mostly conscripted. That coupled with the massive inflation that, uh, that has gone on in ISIL held territory, how, what is the DEA and the FBI's long-term plans for when ISIL inevitably collapses as a nation? Well, this is more of an FBI thing than a DEA thing. Um, and I don't know the statistics that you're citing, although I guess I'm not surprised that some number are either conscripted or that the hardcore membership is a relatively small percentage. Um, there's also a premise in your question that it's going to collapse. I believe that's probably right, um, but that's not right right now. So, uh, you know, whenever something like that happens, bad guys don't go away. They sort of reform. Uh, Al Qaeda hasn't gone away, by the way, but other terrorist groups have faded over time. But they tend to reform. There's sort of an amoeba-like quality to it. And so I'm not sure that I if you're right and ISIL collapses because its ability to self-govern is somewhat limited, that it won't sort of rear up in some other fashion. There will always be, for the rest of your natural lives, 
um, some groups out there that uh, want to do us great harm. It may not be ISIS anymore. Right now it is. So I don't know that I have a much better answer to that question. But we, we, have, o we have seen over time sort of a migration of bad guys from sort of one thing to another. It'll continue. Um, I don't know how much knowledge you have on this topic. It might be somewhat going out on a limb, but uh, do you have any comments or insight regarding the 1980s crack epidemic in South Central LA and the allegations surrounding the CIA's involvement? Yeah, I think it's utter nonsense. I, I'm not trying to be flipped. I think some, some good questions deserve short uh, and definitive answers, and I think it's utter nonsense. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, hypothetically, if you were the next president of the United States, what whoa, would be? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> let, let, let me make a list of things that ain't happening, okay? <laughs> president of the United States, center fielder for the Nationals, ain't happening, okay? What would be your first step in defeating ISIS? Well, I gotta tell you, I've seen a lot of what we've been trying to do up close. Um, a lot of it is classified, highly classified, and properly so. Um, this is a very, very tough nut to crack because it's not a state, right? It's stateless. Um, and so I actually think our multi-pronged strategy is a good one and a thoughtful one, although not always an effective one. And those are different things. I'm not sure that I would change it very much from what I see. And here's where I'm going to be complete. Why are you wearing an A's hat, by the way? What's going, <laughs> what's going on with that? Right? You're a Yankees fan? <laughs> um, I'm not sure I would change it very much, and this part of my answer is unfair to you, but I can't really describe in full why I think our current strategy is a good one. But I do. I think it's multi-pronged and reasonably effective, given that it's a stateless actor. Um, so we've, I've heard murmurs about uh, ISIS involvement or presence in uh, South America, notably Brazil. Um, how does this perhaps tie in with the DEA uh, as if they were to move up into places like Mexico yeah. and um, I guess come with partners or partner with the cartels uh, in Mexico? Uh, so I've, I've heard similar reports. I don't give them much credit. Uh, ISIS is largely not a South American or Central American thing, right? It's of Syria and Iraq based. Uh, I've also heard reports, which I don't credit, about terrorists coming across the Mexican border or terrorist training camps uh, in Mexico. I think Director Comey put it best, uh, FBI Director Comey, not happening. Um, it's just not happening. Now, let, let, let's, let's be clear. We have absolutely seen cases, including drug cases, where the proceeds of the sale of narcotics have gone overseas to fund terrorist groups, right? Hezbollah being a very good example of that. But by and large, this notion that ISIS is creeping across the Mexican border is really just fiction. Uh, I'm not saying it can happen. I'm not saying it won't happen. I'm saying it ain't happening. Um, and you know, also the stuff you sometimes see in the news about terrorist training camps on the border, not true. Um, again, not that it, I guess, theoretically couldn't happen. I, I would very few things I would rule out other than being president or playing center field for the Nationals, uh, but that ain't happening. How, if at all, have past U.S. policies catalyzed or aided in the development of ISIS? That's a very good question. Uh, how have they aided in the development? Right, I mean, you can almost go, well, you can go back pretty far in our history, not just our history, but you know the history of of, of many different cultures to see that you have disenfranchised groups, right, who are seeking something that they don't presently have, in this case, some sort of, you know, ideal, you know, sort of state, um, sort of soured by what they see in the West, I think unfairly so. Uh, I'm not sure that there are particular things we do that inspire them to hate us more than they already hate us. Uh, 
that's in a way sort of a blame the victim thing that I'm not willing to engage in. Uh, I'm not giving you a very good answer because it's a very hard question. Uh, but uh, in my view, the corruption starts uh, with those who have corrupted a religion of peace and who want to impose their view of it on others, not through U.S. policies. Now, let's, you know, pretty clear, the invasion of Iraq uh, was a catalyst, right? Uh, it, and to the extent that governments in the Middle East fail and we're not there to help them, um, it allows the spread of this cancer. But I don't really think of it as, you know, if the U.S. policy was X or Y or Z, that these groups wouldn't exist. I believe they still would. So. Earlier you mentioned uh, Mexico and marijuana. I'm just curious, uh, will you speak to the uh, question of whether our American drug use causes violence in other countries like Mexico? Yeah. And how much? Yeah. Our, so we are the greatest demand in the world for illegal drugs, right? Marijuana, meth, coke, um, heroin. Uh, and the amount of violence attached to it is absolutely astonishing. And so to the extent you think, well, it's just a little bit of marijuana or it's just a little bit of that is, is ridiculous. Because people are dying in other parts of the world to satisfy our demand, right? How much? Well, I'll, I'll answer it in a slightly different way. For the first time in many, many, many years, the violent crime rate in the United States is going back up. Uh, anyone here from Milwaukee? Uh, ho uh, homicide rate in Milwaukee, I believe, is up something like 70%. Anyone here from Houston? It's up close to 50%. Anyone here from Baltimore? It's up close to 55 or 60%. We haven't seen that in a long time. Uh, very, very dangerous stuff. Now, it's not just the drug trade, but a lot of it is drug gangs. Right? So what you have, you have this unholy alliance. You have Mexican cartels, big, sophisticated, violent cartels, that partner with drug gangs, street gangs in the United States. And when these street gangs are competing for turf, your homicide rate goes up. Now, it tends to be gang on gang, but that doesn't make it better, right? Uh, it's still you know, young men, pr primarily young men, primarily young men of color, who are being killed in the streets of America, and in large part because of our demand for drugs. So I don't know that I can give you a precise you know, uh, data relationship, but I can tell you that it's a, uh, a sort of a, a vile and unholy alliance, and it's linked to an increasing uh, 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 rate of violent crime in the United States. Extremely dangerous. That's, by the way, one reason I'm so proud of the work we do. I said earlier, I, I hate the notion that the uh, DEA gets bumper stickered. We're not putting kids who smoke pot in jail. Um, that's not our thing, right? Uh, we don't condone it. But to the extent people are using pot, which is stupid, I don't want to sort of mince words here, um, that may be a state or local case. We're working on those big violent cartel cases. And so I have men and women all around the world at risk, in part because of the demand for drugs in the United States. My men and women are at risk. Uh, yes. Um, I, I'd like to know uh, what can we do uh, better to combat ISIS because um, I, I, I remembered how it was just one year ago this weekend where there was a, an execution by ISIS in Moore, Oklahoma. And I'm just wondering if it can happen in Moore, Oklahoma. It can happen anywhere. So uh, what, can, uh, what could we do uh, better to uh, combat ISIS? That, sir? No, it's a very good question. It can happen anywhere because you know, we have lost souls everywhere, uh, and we have folks following ISIS on Twitter all the time. And so the notion that it can happen here is just fanciful. Boy, uh, we've always had lost souls. Uh, that is not different. Uh, you know, social media is not brand new, but it's you know, a relative recent invention. And our ability to follow these people and to predict their behavior right, is extraordinarily difficult. Right, and we also live in a country of law, so we have to, you know, we don't have predictive crime, uh, or at least not, you know, maybe in the movies. Uh, 
but not really in real life. And we're losing these folks when they go dark, when they switch to other media platforms. So I don't know that we're going to stop it, okay? I don't know that we're going to stop it. I do know this, maybe this will make you feel a little bit better. Uh, the FBI does a miraculous job, I don't think this is an overstatement, a miraculous job of um, sorting through the data that remains after the going dark issue, um, uh, intervening, surveilling, investigating, arresting where they can. I assure you, you don't know about all of their successes. Uh, that's just the way it has to be, right? Um, we, we certainly know about the failures. They get a lot of attention. Uh, but the success rate for the FBI and the DEA and other law enforcement agencies is very, very high. We just don't always get to talk about it. Um, but I don't think we're going to stop it. Um, I don't, I don't want to sort of mislead you. I just don't think we're going to stop it. At least not all of it, right? They only have to succeed once. Hello? Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank well, you again. I, I believe it's on. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, thank you again for your, for your time oh, my, uh, my this pleasure. evening. Yeah. I, I wanted to transition back to, to Mexico. Uh, I was reading your article and your comments on El Chapo Guzman. Ah. Uh, and the reason why I bring this up is I have a, a lot of friends in Latin America and Mexico, and uh, the, the narco culture and the narco cultura is very fascinating uh, from a documentary standpoint. So just hearing personal um, accounts from, from good friends as to how a lot of these guys can, can live in security, feel comfortable going in uh, to these home states, especially uh, Sinaloa and Culiacan. Uh, and the, really the, the embarrassing, well, is quite very embarrassing for Peña Nieto at the moment, and his, his, his staff, the way that these things are handled. It, it, is it true, uh, I guess kind of combining two questions into one, the way that it is handled, one, very afraid of the extradition process for the El Chapo Guzman when, to when, perhaps. When, when you say how it was handled, do you mean? I would say his arrest and his incarceration, his clear escape. Uh, was it fear initially of housing him in the United States, of him, I guess, singing and giving up a... So a let me take, again, let me take the first part first because of the risk. I won't remember it in absolutely. a few moments. Absolutely. But I'll let you get to the second. So, look, let's be clear, right? There's a tremendous amount of violence in the United States as a result of drug trafficking, but the amount of violence in Mexico far outstrips the amount of violence in the United States. So imagine that you are the president of Mexico and you just laid your hands on Chapo Guzman, right? Uh, one of the biggest drug lords in the history of that country. And sure, we have him under indictment in a whole bunch of different federal courts in the United States, but I completely understand why they want him. The, the terror, the havoc, the destruction, the violence that he has brought to Mexico is astonishing. So, you know, just because the United, we're the United States doesn't mean, you know, we get him. We want him. We wanted him. We tried to extradite him. But I understand the interest in the Mexican government of wanting him right there. I don't know what your, the second part of your question is, but... I, I guess it, it's exactly what you were just going along the lines of. It found it is for him being housed there, it was a great boost to Peña Nieto's uh, politics. It was great... Uh, well, but, but they also have a real interest, right? Uh, the Mexican government has a genuine interest in prosecuting Mexican criminals, just as we have a real interest in prosecuting American criminals. Um, maybe I'm assuming that part of your question has to do with our confidence in their system and whether we should have permitted it. But they're a sovereign nation, so we don't get to permit it. We only get to ask. And because they're a sovereign nation, they get to say no. Um, I will say this. Uh, we have a huge, we the DEA have a huge presence in Mexico. This is tough, violent, difficult work. Fortunately, there are men and women, unbelievably courageous men and women in Mexico that we have vetted, that we trust, and who, with whom we work very closely. I mean, our law enforcement can be in danger in this United States. Uh, too often, uh, they are. They're in the line of fire. In Mexico, right, I mean, your entire family's at risk. Your village could be at risk. And yet, there are men and women there who work with us at great personal risk. So I understand their interest in wanting to keep him there, one of the biggest drug lords in their history, and prosecute him there. Unfortunately, there's also corruption in Mexico, right? Not a surprise. Uh, and he got out. You know, it's not like they dug a mile tunnel and just happened to come up through a shower stall. I mean, that, was, that wasn't just luck. Um, that's very, very disturbing. 
Um, but I understand why they want them there. We also want them here. I'm hoping, uh, A, that we get them again, and I believe we will, and B, that they'll extradite them this time. No, th did, I, did I step on your second question? Uh, no, it was just in the matter of, it, to, to combat perhaps that corruption, housing him in the United States, the fear that that posed perhaps Mexican officials of uh, maybe being in, in a particular situation that may not look so much in their favor had it been exposed uh, to exactly you know, his methodology of being able to escape yeah. for so long and, and be on the lam yeah, is, so is truly not to his own doing, but in fact. He has, it seems like he may have had some help. Um, <laughs> Um, this is more about the Middle East. Um, how does the FBI feel about Assad and the Syrian revolution after ISIS brought appearance and men presence in Syria? Okay, um, can you say that one more time, but just a little more slowly? Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, how does the FBI feel about Assad and the Syrian revolution after ISIS brought appearance and men presence in Syria? Or not just the Syrian revolution, just the spring, the Arab Spring in general. Yeah. So if I were the director of the FBI, I would probably say the following. Uh, you know, we don't really, we, it doesn't really take positions on, you know, the politics of other countries. Again, not trying to avoid your question, but let me tell you why I say that, because I think it's important for you, to for you to understand how the FBI is centered in our society. It is by design not a political organization. You know how many men and women work at the FBI? About 35,000. Uh, about 13,500 of whom are special agents. In that organization of 35,000 people, do you know how many are politically appointed? And the answer is one, only one. And by design, he, the director, Jim Comey, has a 10-year term. And why does he have a 10-year term? Specifically designed so that the director outlasts any one president, even somebody who's reelected. So the FBI is purposefully built in many ways to be outside of politics. So it would never take a position, even though it's a very good question, on Syrian politics any more than it would take a position on American politics. It's just not something that's in its, sort of in its DNA, if that makes sense. Uh, so that's really the, it's a good question, but I think that's the most fair answer. Um, yes, sir. So I'd like to turn the conversation a little back, bit back closer to a home. Bit, a little bit more about me? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, and more specifically okay. to your agency. So yeah. the DEA has caught a little bit of flack recently for what some perceive as administrative leniency in prosecuting agent misconduct. What yep. do you say to those claims, and how are you going to address them going forward? Yeah. Uh, so some context for people who don't have it. It was, and I don't know if you're referring to the recent article in USA Today or just more generally that we have not done a very good job of policing ourselves. Uh, so I, again, I have a very simple answer to a very good question. I think it's true. We have not done a very good job of policing ourselves. I find it to be terribly disappointing. Okay? So uh, I'm not one to mince words. Uh, I don't like what I'm seeing. Now, let me uh, say something else. When you talk about the culture of the DEA, uh, our culture, 99 plus percent of it, are men and women doing extraordinary work around the country. And so sometimes I fear that we are defined by our least common denominator. Uh, in any organization, including at Furman, people will do something stupid. And if you're only defined by the things that people do that are stupid, um, that's a rough place to be. So I can have 99% of my men and women doing tough, difficult, dangerous work on the streets, and I can have some idiot, uh, and I do, uh, you know, having sex with a prostitute in Bogota, uh, which happened, uh, that was funded by a cartel, which happened, and we're defined by that. And so I guess I have two answers. One is uh, I am unhappy with our uh, disciplinary process. Believe it or not, I only have very limited control over it. It's designed to be sort of outside of me. And I also don't like the notion that we're defined by our least common denominator. That I have to live with. But if you want a very straight answer to a very good question, I am not happy.
Hi, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I've really enjoyed hearing what you've been saying about um, ISIS and combating drugs well, here. Well, th thank God you have such bad judgment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so this kind of pertains to the first question asked by Jonathan, and I'm sorry if this is a sore subject, but okay. I think this is an important uh, topic that needs yeah, to be discussed. Fi fire away. Um, so right now, uh, both marijuana and heroin are classified as Scheduled One controlled substances. Yet the United States has a patent on the exact same chemical compounds within marijuana for neuroprotective properties. Um, if we're worried about illegal markets supplying heroin and other drugs, is not one of the most obvious solutions removing marijuana from Schedule 1 and decriminalizing it nationwide so that we can focus on drugs that are actually life-threatening? Yeah, so it's a very good question. Again, I, I'm going to sort of argue with some of the premises in it. Uh, let me, get, let me give you a few facts to sort of um, frame the debate. By the way, let me be clear. I think it's a debate we ought to have. I really do. Um, there have been something like 300, or f less than 300, but approaching 300 legitimate research, medical research projects in the United States to look at whether or not marijuana has medicinal value. Um, so far, uh, no project has shown a medicinal value to smoking leaf marijuana. There have been extracts from marijuana that have been synthesized and are being marketed as safe for human consumption, right? And maybe that's what you're referring to. There are extracts that can be sort of safely consumed. Uh, there's one that I think helps people regain appetite uh, after uh, surgery. There's some that I believe uh, are now in testing for childhood epilepsy hey, if we can find stuff in marijuana that helps children with epilepsy, I am at the front of the parade. But if you're talking about smoking leaf marijuana, uh, we have never found a legitimate research result that showed a medicinal value. So two slightly different things. With respect to scheduling, um, DEA doesn't schedule by itself. It schedules with the FDA. And by and large, they're the scientists, and we take their recommendations. It's in Schedule 1. There's some other stuff in Schedule 1, like heroin, that's a hell of a lot more dangerous. But that's not what determines what goes into Schedule 1, right? It's whether or not it's addictive and whether or not there's a medicinal value. If we find that there is, uh, I assume it'll get moved out of Schedule 1. And as long as there isn't, and again, I'm talking about smoking leaf marijuana, I assume it'll stay. This is actually, uh, I have found, a, a very, very complex debate. Um, and I don't know that I know all the parameters of it, or all the dimensions of it, I should say. Um, but my understanding is where there is legitimate research to be done, we've supported it. Um, and so far, the results have been as I described. And like I said, if we find a medical value, I'm at the front of the parade. And in some cases, again, we have with uh, synthesized components of it. Yeah, and, and, I w and CBD oil, cannabidiol, I believe, oil, is what I was referring to. An extract from the plant, but not the smoking of the plant. And so again, uh, I'm not going to be on the wrong side of childhood epilepsy. If, uh, if we find something that's going to help that, I'm in front of the parade. Okay, I'm the band leader. No, very good question. Thank you. Yeah, so you touched on this a little bit with um, some of the legal issues you guys are facing with uh, going dark and all that. Um, but I just want to learn a little bit more about the preventative measures that the federal government are taking um, in the recruitment process of ISIS. Um, and how the federal government walks the line between um, acting on suspicions as they should versus violating civil rights. Yeah, that, that's, first of all, an important line, as you well know. It's sort of subsumed within your question. Uh, and second, the hard one to sometimes see in advance. The only thing I can tell you, and I, and I, and I, I hope I answered your question in a similar fashion, is that, and again, there's a leap of faith here. You have to believe me that the FBI is very, very careful about protecting the individual civil rights of American citizens. I know it doesn't always appear that way in the movies, but I've been there in real life. And I've seen their work up close. 
um, sometimes those lines only become clear in hindsight, right? Um, you know, the difference between somebody espousing violent rhetoric and acting on it, uh, we only see it after the fact. And so the FBI is criticized for not doing enough or not doing it faster. Or when they do it faster, they're criticized for being precipitous, right? Uh, or, not, um, uh, or not sort of embracing First Amendment rights. Extraordinarily difficult line to walk. And people, I can tell you, because I've been in these meetings, struggle with this. What is this guy saying? What do we think he's going to do? And when do we act? Because if we act too fast, we're criticized. And if we act too slow, we're criticized. Uh, and it's just a very, very difficult line to draw. Um, I'm not being facetious. Uh, not to you or anyone else in this room. Come join the FBI. We need you. Uh, come join the DEA. We need you. I'd like you to see it firsthand and up close what it is they do. It's really pretty remarkable. But imagine living in a world, because we do, where if we go too fast or too slow, we've screwed up. All right, and everybody else gets to second guess it. It's really hard. Now, I'm not saying feel sorry for me. We've chosen to do this. We love what we do. Um, but people struggle with getting that right. And sometimes then, you know, if we do go too fast, we run that risk. But the risk on the other side is great too. Tough, tough one, tough line to draw. I don't think I have a very good answer to your question, but you've probably already determined that. All right, well maybe this will be a, uh, a happier question to answer. Um, and you kind of touched on it. Um, you said you love what you do. Um, you've done a very wide array of things, um, being the federal attorney and all, and um, law enforcement and all that. What do you think, being the head of the DA, DA now, like what do you think the thing that you've learned from any previous employment or position that you've held um, that holds today as being the most valuable thing you've learned? Wow. It is a happier question, but it is not an easier one. Um, boy, oh boy, what have I learned? I'm better now than I was 20 years ago. I've learned that. I've learned that judgment um, is probably the single most important thing, which often can't be taught. Uh, I've learned to be very, very careful, but not cautious, if that makes sense. In other words, identifying risk and managing risk, but not avoiding risk. Uh, I've learned that values are a lot more important than skills. Uh, I think we make the mistake in this country of hiring for skills. If I were the conductor of the London Symphony Orchestra and my cellist got hit by a bus, um, and I have a good friend here, Bernie Ellis, who's a prominent attorney in town who's a gifted pianist, um, I would not hire Bernie to replace the cellist. I need a skill. But at the FBI and the DEA, I need values. We need to hire for values, men and women who have values. We'll teach them the skills. Uh, I've learned that values are much, much impor more important than skills. Um, I don't know, this is completely unrelated, but my son told me to say something, so I will. I've always listened to him. I told you he's one of my heroes, and I mean that. Um, whatever it is you choose to do, you have plenty of time to do it. I'm talking not to Bernie, who's old like me, uh, but to the students here. Uh, there's no rush. You might feel now that you're in college like you got to know right now, right now, what it is you're going to do. When you go home for Thanksgiving, your well-meaning aunts and uncles say, what are you going to do? And I think it's perfectly okay to say, I don't know yet. Uh, I didn't go to law school until I was 27. Uh, Bernie, you were 27. You know, we were among the older people in our class, which seems kind of odd. We were classmates at the University of Virginia Law School. Um, Take your time. Figure out what it is you want to be. Uh, at 27 or 30 when we graduated, we only had, what, 45 years to practice law? If we had gone five years earlier, we would have had 50. It's not a big difference in the end. Um, take a deep breath. There's lots and lots of good things to do in public service. And by the way, just because I was a federal prosecutor, and now I know I'm off on a crazy tangent, just bear with me, stay with me. Um, doesn't mean you have to be in law enforcement. You can be a federal public defender. You can work uh, for, you know, you can work in, in, in community organizing, public housing, uh, you know, homeless veterans. There's all sorts of ways to serve this great country. FBI and DEA are just two ways. Um, but whatever it is you choose to do, uh, 
use good judgment, uh, emphasize values over skills, uh, and take your time. What else? Do you see um, a big difference in our law? I have, uh, I love the law, and I, I study it, and I see it's a hero law, and I wonder what, what a citizen can do uh, in the awareness department in the conflict between that law and the U.S. Constitution. Between, I'm sorry, between which two laws? The Hera law. The, the heroin? Shahara. Oh, Shari oh, I'm sorry, between I'm Sharia sorry, law. I'm sorry, it's a southern draw. <laughs> <laughs> and northern ears, right? Because <laughs> Virginia is the north, right? <laughs> and northern Virginia is just as bad as Boston, I guess. <laughs> Doesn't even count. Oh, the conflict between Sharia law and, the, and, the, and constitutional law. Is that the, sort of the thrust of your question? Well, there, there's obviously a, con a, a, a conflict, but I don't worry about Sharia law here, if that's what your question is getting at. Um, our country is so deeply rooted in the Constitution, and it's a gift that literally keeps on giving. Uh, it doesn't concern me. I mean, there are things that are happening overseas that concern me greatly, but it's not just Sharia law, right? There's so much disease and illness in West Africa and poverty uh, in East Africa and turmoil and you know, uh, uh, immigrant crises all around the world that are rooted in many things other than Sharia law. We benefit here. We, we, are, we have won, you have won the cosmic lottery to be born in the United States of America. You've literally won the cosmic lottery. And I think we are deeply, deeply a nation of law. And so I don't really worry about it. I, I know it's not a perfect answer to a good question. It may not even be a good answer to a good question. But it's not something that I'm concerned about here and now. Okay? I have a question about heroin addiction at home. Mm -hmm. As a nurse, I've seen a lot of heroin addiction as far as breaking apart families and especially with a lot of the changes from the scheduling of the prescription narcotics. Do you think ultimately this is going to be a battle that's going to be won at a state level yeah. or at a national level? I mean, how, how uh, can we come together to better uh, fight this? And not just heroin, I take it, but all. Correct. All yeah. of it. Yeah, Heroin's so making quite a, the comeback. Yeah, so let me, that's a great question. Thank you. Another way to serve. There you go, as a nurse. Remarkably important stuff. Um, so how do we combat this? We're not going to prosecute our way out of it. And I, by the way, I, I hate the term war on drugs. I will not use the term war on drugs other than to say I hate the term. <laughs> okay? Um, it's just a misnomer. And I'm sorry we got stuck with it. Um, it has to be a multi-pronged strategy. It has to include, I got a very good question about demand. It has to include demand reduction. It has to include treatment. It has to include community outreach, whether faith-based or otherwise. It has to include enforcement, right? We're not going away. Um, we just did, I, I don't, how many of you actually heard about this? I hope every hand goes up, but I fear only a few will, about our national take back initiative, which we held this uh, weekend. All right, a few people know about it. Um, the DEA, twice a year going forward, because I've reinitiated it, um, will hold take-back programs so folks can clean out their medicine cabinets and bring us that stuff that's unwanted or expired. Right? That's not enforcement, even though we're an enforcement agency, but it's part of a community outreach strategy to try and make medicine cabinets and therefore homes and therefore communities safer. Um, we have to be a part of that. There are tons of organizations that I've seen that help us do that, but we are not going to prosecute our way out of this. There's just no way. It's going to be uh, private. It's going to be not-for-profit. It's going to be state, local, tribal, and federal. And we've got to hit it from every angle. And my God, we have got to stop the demand. Um, the DEA, I think, has done, uh, I'm gonna, I, I think you can tell by now, I'm pretty candid, uh, a poor job, a poor job at demand reduction. Now again, it's not our central core mission but we have not done a good enough job. We're going to get better. So th and thank you for being a nurse. Um, so we have time for one more yeah, question. One more. Good evening. 
Uh, first of all, Acting Director, thank you so much for protecting our country all these years. We appreciate it very much. Can I tell you something? Yes, uh, sir. It's a privilege. Um, well, thank you. I, no, it's, I, I don't know. No, no. It's, 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 it's really, truly a privilege. Um, but there's some men and women standing on either side who actually protect it. I'm just sort of a figure. And, and they are, and I thank yeah. them, along with the soldiers that are sitting here. Yeah. So I'm very appreciative they're, of that. They're, they're the ones who are protecting you, <laughs> not me. I'm just getting in the way. Um, my, my question is um, probably related more with the FBI. Okay. And that would be, we see a lot of, um, and, and I think everyone has experienced this, uh, cyber attacks. Yes. Do we have any countermeasures for cyber attacks? And, and what, what are the possibility of doing something with some of those countries that are conducting what, these what, cyber attacks against us? What a great question. So I think there are basically two types of organizations in America, companies, entities, what have you. Those that have been hacked and those that don't know that they have been hacked. That's it. That's the entire universe of companies. Um, and if someone rang your doorbell at 3 a.m., you wouldn't go running downstairs and fling open the door. You'd probably look through the curtain or peephole if you have one to see who's coming. One of the things we can do is protect ourselves. There are so many scams out there. There's good information on how to protect yourself. Um, do it. Don't open links from people you don't know. Uh, if anything looks suspicious, right, you know, you retype the, the browser line yourself. Uh, this, like ISIS, ain't going away. Um, and there are all sorts of reasons why people attack us. Um, one can just be straight out espionage, industrial or you know, national security espionage, to steal our stuff, to steal our secrets. Uh, but all of you, all of you here, right, you're, you're, you're in a bank online, your social lives are online, right? You buy, uh, you buy, you buy your airline tickets online, you, 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 know, you bid on stuff online, your music's online, and that exposes you. So everybody in this room is vulnerable. I don't mean you should lie awake right, with the sweats tonight, but I do mean that you got to be really, really careful because uh, while some of the cyber attacks are sort of espionage related, others are just straight out crime. Trying to get your bank account information, your social security number, your date of birth, change your passwords, don't give it out, don't do what my wife does, which is post it right above the computer on a sticky note. <laughs> um, just got to be careful. You know, can we go after countries that do it? Well, it's not always countries. Again, sometimes it's, you know, just individual actors. Sometimes it's countries, uh, but more and more it's just, you know, people hacking away at us, and they're going to get through. Um, so just be very careful. It's dangerous out there. Um, Protect yourselves, right? Treat your phone or your, your laptop or your iPad uh, the way you would treat your front door, right? Just be wary. Don't be worried. Be wary. So, well, listen, let me say something. Um, this is a great thrill for me. Uh, this is going to sound corny. Every now and then I'm given to that. So either indulge me or forgive me. Uh, but I'm looking out here at several hundred people who are the future of this country, literally the future of this country. You can do great things. Uh, serve in some way. Again, I don't care what side it's on. Again, whether you're a federal defender or a federal prosecutor, um, I'll leave you with just one last thought. A wise man, I don't know which one, once said, you make a living by what you get, you make a life by what you give. So thank you very much. We have a gift for you from the advanced team. Thank you, Thank you so much. Oh, it's very nice of you. Thank you.